Well, hello and welcome to all of you. And may I just start by saying how impressed I am with our audience today who on a Friday night have decided to spend their time picking through the intricacies of youth activism in our country. It's great to have you all with us and goodness me, we have quite the panel and quite the event ahead of us. It's generated a lot of interest on social media, rightly so, and I really look forward to kicking things off. But firstly, let me start by thanking Accountability Lab, who has brought us here today, along with their partners, the Danish Embassy of South Africa. Thank you all very much for making today possible. With that said, let's get on to the main event. South Africa boasts a proud history of youth activism, but in recent years, it feels as though youth activism has been at something of a low ebb. Why is this the case? And how can we build a coalition of youth activism to hold government to account? To confront that question, I'm joined this evening by a formidable and extremely talented panel. Many people who will be known to all of you. First, we have Professor Mamogheti Pakeng, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, a professor of maths education and uh, recipient of the Order of Baobab in Silver, also deputy mother to many young South Africans. We have activist Shaira Kala, who rose to prominence as SRC president at WITS and was a leader at the forefront of the Fees Must Fall movement, also recently completed an MSc at the University of Oxford and a well-known person in, in the South African public sphere. And Koketso Moeti, who is founding executive director of Amantla.mobi, my, my fellow co-panelist in many panels. And uh, she has received enough fellowships to sink a considerable ship from Obama fellowships to Aspen fellowships to Atlantic fellowships, and has published her writing in a wide variety of places, including The Guardian and Al Jazeera. So thank you all so much for joining us on this panel today. And I'd like to kick off with you, Shaira, as you respond to the opening prompt and we'll go to each of our panelists before we kick off a, a conversation. The floor is yours and I've asked the panelists to start with opening remarks of around three minutes. Thanks so much, Cesare. It's great to be with you all today. Um, I think we've seen it play out when the youth expresses their voice, um, it's swiftly dealt with. And it's often seen as a threat to the status quo. So what I am really interested uh, today in focusing on is trying to push us to ask, what role do other actors and agitators play alongside youth um, who can sometimes indirectly be a part of silencing the youth by their own silence or by their lack of imagination on how things can be different. So um, there's a violent dismissiveness often in how quick society is to ridicule young people who are fighting for change. And beyond what seems like a sterile passivity of this moment, like you've said, there seems to be an ebb. Um, there's also a generation that have been deeply affected by um, the action and the activism that, that we've seen through fees must fall, through roads must fall. There's been police brutality. We've seen many students um, and young people more broadly, not just students at universities, suffering from mental health challenges um, and even the criminality of our high unemployment rate. So we've seen the latest statistics on youth unemployment at over 60%, some of the highest in the world. And despite being in a system structurally built against youth, when I have conversations with young people, um, it's interesting how things like universal basic incomes and having a moral and social right to the economy um, are not seen as positive things. People still really believe that hard work alone leads to getting employed, even though unemployment is structural, that grants create laziness, and then you explain that 
Poverty is intergenerational because of structural injustice. Low income is actually a code word for economically looted because the structural injustice that we see has been built on the backs of millions of people. So in spite of all of this, um, you know, the power of neoliberal capitalism as an ideology uh, that I think young people feel so defeated by in many cases, um, there's also sparks that will light the way. And we see it in a much younger, intelligent, global youth voice demanding accountability for the mess that the world is in. Because they, like we, should understand that we're set to pay the price for this mess. So as the conversation unfolds, this is, this is, these are some of the issues that I'm going to unpack a little bit more. Thanks so much, Shara, uh, for some provocative opening remarks. Um, we'll move now on to Koketso. So I think that um, I'm not one to talk about whether there is a rise or a dearth of youth activism or activism in any form of or sort, right? What we do know for a fact is that over the last couple of years, we have seen the power of the ideological numerical push of young people, masses of young people across the continent, across the world. And this has been able to affect significant changes. We're talking about um, whether it is in terms of the backlash against unconstitutional presidential term um, elections, um, the reversal of unpopular decisions, such as you know, repeated bans of social media, but also over and above that, there's been a significant challenging by young people of the monopoly on political discourse, right? Um, we've seen it in many forms and in many ways, but we also can't ignore how also youth are not a homogenous mass, right? And so when we talk about activism, for, for example, in South Africa, very often people will refer to the Fees Must Fall movement and so on, which kind of overshadows the other many things that are happening throughout the country, right? And so this is a question of what's visible and what's unseen. We may talk about, you know, there's a slowdown in youth activism, but again, just because we do not see it doesn't mean it is not there. And I think that's the challenge that I do want to pose. What do we, what discourses are overshadowed? What narratives are dominating discourse that we are not seeing? But over and over consistently, particularly in the last couple of years, not uniquely to South Africa, not uniquely to this continent, we are seeing young people push back, push back on decisions that are being made by people who will not live with the consequences thereof, right? We are seeing push back against injustices that the people who created or the historic injustice and the ways in which it has continued right now um, people will not live with the consequences thereof, you know? And so that's what, that would be my starting point on the conversation and the prompt. Fantastic. It's, uh, it's amazing to get panelists with both powerful statements, which also remain in time. So I think we're, we're in for a good conversation today. Thanks so much, uh, Koketso. And um, Professor Pagen, who's asked me to also refer to her as Kheti. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, CJ. Um, I want to make two points. I mean, I think I think Shaira and Gopetso um, really made um, a good intro. And, and I want to start with, with uh, you know, taking on one, what Gopetso said. My, my concern, I mean, my view is that we've got to start asking what counts as activism. Um, does activism always have to be a protest? If it is not a protest, what does it look like? Perhaps even if it starts with a protest, what does it graduate to? What does it, what does it become after how long? Because there is a time for rhetoric and then there is a time to do something else. And I, I, think, I think when we say, um, we are not seeing youth activism. Sometimes people mean that they are not seeing student protests. And, and I don't think it means it is not there. I mean, if you think about it, back in 2009, many analysts argued that the youth, the youth of South Africa was apathetic, was apolitical, unaware of history, of the struggle, and you know, they don't know where this country comes from. 
uh, they were given many names, corn freeze, Mandela generation, black diamonds, whatever. And it was almost like it was many newspaper articles, you know, 2012, they, there were many. And then 2015, boom. And when it happened in 2015, the very same people who were writing beautiful articles about the youth being apathetic and apolitical, you know, started saying, what is this? They shouldn't protest this way. We were activists in the 80s. We know how to do it. They should do it this way. And then I, I remember sitting in some meetings saying, but why is it that your way of protesting is the way of protesting or the way of activism? Why do you not call this activism? And so I think we should, we should, we should sort of unpack what counts as activism. And, and when we say the youth is apathetic, what, what do we mean? When we don't see protest, what else is happening? Thanks, Susan. Absolutely. I think before um, I ask you to respond to each other and, and, and think through what, what each of the other panelists um, has said, I have a few specific questions from your respective perspectives, because I think you each bring different dimensions to this conversation. Um, so I just want to start with you, Koketso, and, and ask, particularly in the digital realm, because of the work that Amanda.mobi does um, and the groundbreaking work that it's done in that realm, can you talk us through some of the lessons that you've learned about uh, youth activism, particularly in the digital sphere? So while I have no doubt that the digital world opens up a whole new set of possibilities, like communicating and coordinating at a scale previously not possible, I am hesitant to exceptionalize it. Um, throughout history, technology um, has always shifted and activists have found ways to use it. So for example, you think about how print technology enabled publications such as the Labour Bulletin to come to exist, right? So I'm not a fan of the phrase digital activism. I think there's activism and tools like digital technology are just that. Another tool of many that can be used as part of the activism we do, you know? And I think that's the key thing. Um, this exceptionalization can be quite dangerous. When I think about how people talk about social networks, right? As, you know, just a thing that existed now. You think about a previous piece of technology that existed that was called the fax machine. If I had a fax machine, I could only fax people with a fax machine. And therefore fax machine holders had their own unique social network, right? In which they could fax each other. So again, I go back to, I'm hesitant to exceptionalize because throughout history, this has been what is going on. And again, it is another tool available to us to use, but we cannot replace people with, to with, people with tools. Tools are just that, tools that we can build with, but also tools that we can destroy with, right? And so we should constantly be thinking about the values, people, that's what we should be centering and the tools will be informed by that. Prof Park, and before I come back to Shaira, uh, as a vice chancellor, you have a unique window, not only onto the kind of student activism that's happening at UCT now, but across the university sector in the country. How do you see the current state of student activism, both from your perspective at UCT, but also more widely in terms of, of the country? I mean, students continue to push. It's how they do it. I mean, I, I find that in 2015, uh, students were united around an issue. So the activism was issue-based. It didn't matter what political movement you belong to. And 2016, it was the same and it went on. At the moment, I see that our students have become more, you know, party-based. And, and, and as, as, as important as that it is, is for them, it feels to me that it dilutes their voice because with that comes competition for the space, for, 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 for the voice and, and everyone wants to stand out. It's no longer about, sometimes it's not so much about the issues. 
uh, sometimes it's so much about who's more visible and who's doing whatever. So, and, 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 and you know, that worries me as much as I know that political organizations, you know, they recruit young people and it's important that young people get involved in this way. I, I wish that um, when students come onto campus, they, I mean, if you think about um, um, the situation with Uyinene last year, I mean, again, that's why I saw students come together. Gender-based violence, they didn't disintegrate into parties, they came together and, you know, and I think, I think we need more of that. And for me, that was the power of fees must fall and roads must fall. It was that united voice on an issue and, um, uh, you know, calling a, a government to account and asking the vice chancellors the same. So it, that I think is, is, is missing and we, we have to ask why and so what does it mean? And by the way, I'm saying this, even as I say, the um, um, uh, activism is not just about protest. Um, you know, that, that united voice can still manifest in other ways of activism. Shaira, um, I'm going to come to you on a specific question and then I'll just ask the panelists to, to start picking up on, on what um, each person has said. But just to, to focus on your unique perspective before I do that, of course, you know, you rose to prominence as um, uh, an important leader in the Fees Must Fall movement, particularly at WITS. It's nearly five years, almost to the month, almost to the day since that movement um, kicked off. How do you reflect on the legacy of Fees Must Fall um, in the context of where youth activism um, sits today? Yeah, thanks, Yizwe. Um, that's always a really difficult question for me to answer. Um, and I would have thought that as the years were going by, a five-year mark would be a point where I could really put down in writing or in some kind of public way, you know, these are some of my reflections, but there's so much that you grapple with on a personal level. Um, and, you know, before I, I, I go into some of my reflections there, I just wanted to pick up on two relevant things that both um, uh, Prof and, and Koketso have said. And the first is that the youth aren't a homogenous group. And, and that is one of the challenges when we have these conversations because there is no way that we can cover every issue. Um, but what I can do is speak from, from my perspective. Um, and what I've been feeling um, when I speak to people in youth in communities, like I was in Makawuse last week, two weeks ago actually. And when I speak to youth at universities or at schools is that there is a heightened conscientization of what's wrong. But there's also the divisions politically, which is something that, that Prof uh, touched on, um, the party politics, so to speak, that people are both frustrated with, but also in the same way um, feel that the issue, their struggles are legitimized by. And in that way, a very leg legitimate issue or a cause uh, like free decolonized education or decommodified and decolonized education can become a political football. And we did see that happen in 2016. So as for my reflections, the posturing of, of the question around um, what would a sustainable youth-led coalition for government accountability look like? It's something that places, it creates a hierarchy of sorts, which places young people at the mercy of an all-powerful government that they must now hold accountable. And I think the real question we need to start asking to move forward is how are we creating spaces for society in general to untap the shared wisdom and new standards of what is acceptable and what is expected of the state and a culture that enables a healthy and healing society, one where the youth aren't seen as the enemy, but rather can be part of the change, can even be part of our governmental structures. And that's not to say that once you've got representation as young people within governmental um, spaces, that you're not off the, off the menu, because it's, it's, it's much bigger than representation. We can talk about that even when we look at the US election. 
But for me, looking at what's happening in Nigeria as well, you know, it reminds me that Fees Must Fall, um, like many other movements, can also cease to transcend the moment within which they're happening. And I think that is the biggest shame because this is a struggle that is very much incomplete. Uh, yes, there were tangible benefits. Um, you know, we saw an end to outsourcing. We saw students and workers come together in a beautiful, important way, historic way. We also saw that um, a wider, you know, group of students were now, you know, able to access state funding. That is a tangible thing. But the structures of our commodified university system still remain intact. And that for me is why I think Fees Must Fall was really the tip of the iceberg. Education is still seen as a, a means of just getting a job. And that is exactly what decolonization was trying to challenge, that it's not just about getting a job, it's also about thinking critically about the society in which you find yourself in and changing that society for the better. So these are some of my most potent reflections and hopes, I guess, as we, as a new generation of young people, um, have what it takes definitely to, to continue the struggle. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to hear those reflections that these five years on, um, and also to see some of the themes that are emerging from this conversation. What I'm gonna do is, is ask other panelists to engage with what they've heard so far, um, so that we can try and keep this conversation you know, with, within a certain um, set of set of themes. Um, so either Kheti or Koketso, is there anything or any themes that are emerging that you'd like to develop on or, or continue to, to challenge or, or think through? I mean, I, I'm, it's interesting what Shaira said about um, uh, education is not just about jobs. And that's true. But in a country with levels of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. How can students, unemployed graduates, not match and demand jobs on the basis, just on a simple basis that they got a degree? I mean, I have a problem with see education being seen that way. But I understand, and, and I think, I often think, why am I expecting them to do that? I think it's us who are privileged who say, but it's not about that. But it is about that, you know, because for some people that's, I'm, I'm, and, and, I, and I guess the issue is who decides what should activism focus on? So we, we see young people who graduate who, who want to protest to get jobs and, and they see that as a big issue. And I, and, and I understand that decolonizing, um, decolonization is not, it's not about that. And of course, you know, the, the discourse of transformation and de decolonization has become so adulterated. You know, it's, 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 it's important, but it's unhealthy. It's, it's about numbers. We don't want it to be about numbers, but in fact, we are challenged just on the basis of numbers. It's, you know, it, so it, it lacks depth because it, it, it's not moving. But, but part of it is because there's bread and butter issues that, that people want resolved. And that's why it becomes simplistic um, and, and not so helpful. So we have to ask ourselves, how do, we, how do we move from there? How do we, even in the space um, where there's just activists that, you know, youth, young activists, that there can be an understanding that uh, um, you know, we are on the same side, we are joined on an issue, and we come from different socioeconomic class. You know, some of us are here, we go back to our shacks. And so I've got another struggle um, that, I'm, that I'm busy with, and I want that struggle to be on the table too, you know? And, and, and those, are, you know, those issues I think are, are important as well. And, and sometimes they're the ones that make the, the group disintegrate. I mean, um, yeah, they, they, they can, divide a group when people start focusing on their bread and butter issues and not lift higher. Okay, so coming to you and also if, if you could also think about this theme just as the discussion unfolds of, of this tension between political organizations, which on the one hand are useful conduits for organized action, but on the other hand can also often undermine um, organic student or youth um, 
or any uh, political action. So I am going to um, kind of like um, not stay in that stream of thought about the party organizing. <laughs> but there's a couple of things that emerge that I have heard that raise an issue for me, right? Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, Katie was mentioning is the whole, you know, the vying for visibility, you know, the whole rock star activism stuff. And I say this as someone who is quite visible, you know, for a number of reasons that you have mentioned. But I think one of the things is that it is, it does a great disservice to think of it as uniquely to this generation. You know, there has been a continuous pattern of that, right? Whether it was women who were marginalized from the record books, whether it was, you know, there's been all of these people who are just not as praised, visible, and glorified. So it's not unique to this generation. It's not unique to this age. Yes, it is a little bit more visible, but it is not something that just happened today. And until we deal with some of the histories that enable this, I think we may only continue this way. So I'm quite hesitant on this issue of, you know, this is my vantage point, and therefore, yeah, this is my vantage point, or people are struggling on this issue versus that issue. I'm quite hesitant to say that, you know, there's a single issue or issues that should solely be prioritized, right? Because all of us have different issues, but at the same time, there are so many issues beyond us as individuals, right? And so for me, one of the things that's very helpful about the way to think about this is we also have to be really humble, you know? There's no single individual organization or movement in whatever form that can do everything. Um, it's tempting when one is organizing, whether it's part of students, whether outside of that, in any space one is organizing, it's tempting to think of oneself and one's movement and one's organization as being at the center of the world. The reality is we are challenging systems, governments, corporations, you know, all these things that have so much more resources and capacity and yeah, that in many ways we are pushed to the periphery, you know? What makes us move forward, what pushes us to that center is the ability to work collectively. So imagine, instead of saying, why are students busy fighting for decom uh, decommodified, decolonized education um, that is accessible? Um, why aren't they focusing on lower education? Imagine if I said, what can me and the people I organize with, right, do to start that and draw the linkages, you know? Because this is an ecosystem. None of us are going to do it all alone. And so we need to be able to, we need to be comfortable with the discomfort of stepping out of our comfort zones, right? that this cannot remain my only vantage point, right? The world is much bigger than that. The crises that exist in the world are much bigger than that. But at the same time, neither me nor my organization are gonna be able to do it on. And I think that's the thing that we sometimes lose when we think about these issues as, oh, if I'm working on X issue, I do not have an obligation or a responsibility to try help build a bigger ecosystem beyond that. In what ways are we coming together to build our social capital? Where we building, we bringing together our skills, our various resources, you know, to make things possible. So I think about, um, so I've got kids and if I'm somewhere doing something, the only reason I'm able to do it is because I've got somebody caring for my kids, right? And so that's an ecosystem that you've, you know, that you've created that enables this change. And I think we should be so much more expansive in our thinking around you know, how are we supplementing each other's work? What are the ways in which I can do this? I can start ways to supplement, but also what are the ways in which I am creating the conditions for the organizing I do to be supplemented, right? So I think, yeah, that would be my contribution to some of the things I've heard. So one thing I, I, I'd like to um, put on the table um, for you all is, Yes, there's a lot of good work going on, um, but there's a crisis. There's a crisis of, of governance. There's a crisis of youth unemployment. There's a crisis of youth poverty. And while these crises affect many people, they disproportionately affect young people. And one would imagine that there would be political mobilization explicitly to deal with the disproportionate effects of this crisis of governance and of 
uh, and, of eco uh, and, uh, and, and our economic malaise. But it feels like there are, there's a lot of organization, you know, in different places, but that extra layer of further coordination, like Goketsu has mentioned, is perhaps missing uh, and has been present in other times. Uh, have we dropped the ball in failing to coordinate across class, gender, race, around these mutually shared crises? Beyond protest. I mean, I, I think it's, it's not about dropping the ball. It's about understanding how difficult it is to do that. Um, and there's been attempts, uh, of course, for people to come together across issues. And I think when we conceptualize what youth activism or youth organizing means beyond just um, a focus on a narrow focus on issues, it's also on the reconceptualization of how we understand value and the measurement of value in itself. And this is something that I touched on, but perhaps didn't explain well enough that thinking in binaries is very dangerous. So I mentioned that getting an education is not just about finding a job. That doesn't mean or diminish that for most people in the world, the avenue into a university is for some kind of socioeconomic um, you know, change that, that might take place. The fact of the matter is that a lot of uh, graduates are unemployed. In fact, when we think about unemployment in itself, it's, it's not just contested in terms of what sector you're in. It's also contested in terms of the changes that are happening globally in our economies. For example, the president just released the fourth industrial revolution report. If you read that report, its main focus is on how economies can benefit from the technologies that are you know, going to be at our at our feet. And that for me misses the whole point of dignity and humanity in, that should be inherent when we think about technology, as Koketsu right, rightfully said, as a tool. Because in and of itself, it really is an empty shell. Anyone can do with it what they please. It can be used to create an even more dystopian reality. But I think what really is important is asking how can digital technologies, just in as example, um, facilitate the transition from this narrow focus on a digital economy of surveillance capitalism and data extractivism, where a handful of US and China-based companies really have a hegemony on um, digital su supremacy, global digital supremacy, to an alternative political and economic project a project which I hope youth in general and conscious progressive people in general can push that is, you know, it's, it's a future that's more democratic, that's more egalitarian, and that pushes public alternatives to today's hierarchical and super privatized consensus and political economy. So those are the structural questions that I think young people need to be very much more critical um, in, pu in pushing forward. Preeti, could I come to you? You know, Cesar, I've been thinking, I mean, as, as Shaira is speaking, is how do we get people to, to focus on the real political issues? Um, so I, I've been thinking, so when you look at, I mean, Koketo talks about an ecosystem, how do you create it? When you have a movement that is as forceful, as powerful, as roads must fall, as trees must fall. How do you do that? Uh, create a much bigger um, and a much bigger focus than, than this issue that they're dealing with. And, and I, think, I, think, I think young people have to be sort of initiated into doing that. And I, and I keep wondering who should do that? Um, because Oftentimes, um, the groups come because there's an issue, but that issue is not about that issue, it's about structural racism and so on. So, so, so they've got to focus on other issues, the, the bigger structural issues. I, I, I think that lack of 
you know, recognizing the ecosystem is what makes, what is for me is the weakness of the student movement and, and, and its inability to survive the post-dramatic moments, if you like, of protests. So there's dramatic moments. But the other thing that we're not talking about that I think is important that perhaps weakens a student movement is when you have, of course you have the ecosystem and there are stars who, who rise and oftentimes is yeah, the visible people. I mean, what's happening now is that um, they get lured into something, into something bigger, to parliament, to whatever. And someone can say, that's an important platform, they'll use it for that. And I'm saying, of course, what it does is that it also creates a sense of careerism, not for the people who are there, but for the people who are here in an environment that we, we are in, that that's where you should work to be. Of course, you want those voices in parliament, but how do you keep the youth focused on the bigger issue rather than just the, their own issues, right? The, your issue is important, but if you focus on the bigger issue, that, you know, I, 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 my worry is that the, the weaknesses are so in the foreground that there's careerism, there's stardom, there's, you know, there's showy, there's whatever. And I, I, I think who should, who should be getting young people into a space where they understand, you know, they create deliberately, intentionally, what's needed to take them to the next level, that things don't fade after the, after the dramatic moment. Well, thank you all very much. I know that there've been various questions coming in, which we're gonna get to so that we can get the, the voices of our audience um, very large. So let's go to some of the questions in the Q and A. Um, and we have a question from Mpumelelo, who says, we have politicized everything. Activism was possible when I was still in high school. 2015, the 16 year old me was looking forward to the unity I used to see on TV and on social media, but unfortunately it's nowhere to be found. I think politicians should deal with the competition amongst them. It's dividing not just the youth, but also the whole country. It is not about who is better. It should be about coming together with our differences and bringing solutions in unity. Would anyone like to respond to Mpumelelo's, Mpumelelo's question about the, di the division created by political parties? I think political parties, I mean, as long as you have elections, there'll be competition. And, and the issue is what, what that competition looks like. And, and, you know, and young people are the best place to recruit people who will propagate the message and, and so on. So I, I, I'm not sure that it will it'll change. The competition will change. It, the issue is can our young people be more enlightened to see through it? Okay, we've got quite a few questions. So I'm gonna ask an, another one for a different panelist. Thanks, um, Kriti. Um, Snotolo asks, taking into account what Shaira said about education as a tool with which to help one think critically about their community and what Prof Pakeng said that activism may not just be about protest, but that there are, that there's more to activism than protest. My question as a township school teacher who believes that schools, not just universities, have a responsibility of shaping young people's lives for tertiary living. I'm going to try and summarize. Yes, essentially, what can we do to mobilize the school sector to hold mm. the government account in education more broadly? I love this question. Um, and it's something that I was thinking about a lot in 2016, because there were two groups on campus. The one is that we need to keep this um, you know, this issue in the university. And the other was that we actually need to keep it in the university, but we also need to move into our communities. We need to explain to people why this is still on the table, why President Zuma's announcement of a 0% increase is inadequate and doesn't deal with the demands of the movement, and how this is just the tip of the iceberg, that a decommodified and decolonized education system 
does not begin and end within the ivory towers of the university. So lately I've been speaking to a lot of equal education's unemployed post-school youth. Um, and this is on other work that I've been doing with the C19 People's Coalition on basic income grants or basic income guarantees. And what's been really amazing is that you've got a group of untapped, an untapped group in, in many ways in broader society beyond the, the equal education networks of young people who are so engaged in sports in cultural activities, even after they finished school. And I think that, you know, creative things like community theater and thinking about how the arts as well and um, digital spaces can be created uh, for communities to hold government accountable, for schools to hold government accountable. There's a lot of innovative things that we can do that are progressive and that are really, really important. One of the things that struck me when, um, you know, the, the harrowing case of Michael Kamape took place, um, you know, when a young boy drowned in a pit toilet, Michael Kamape was his name, is that it took the government months to actually come back to society and say, these are the amount of schools that still have pit toilets. Now, every principal has a cell phone. Why can't we create some kind of system where we are more agile at holding government to account, but also we come together with the skills that we have within society to, to deal with issues that are far reaching. So they're not just going to be beneficial for the schools at a particular, for the kids at a particular school, but that fundamentally change the precedent, change the norms and expectations of how we think about our education and how we think about our community mobilization. And that is the intersection that I think young people have the most to, to, to give and add value to. So it's something I'm really excited about and happy to talk more about other ideas. Okay, so um, allow me to put a quote from Barry Mitchell to you. He quotes Gramsci. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Yeah, yeah. Um, it often feels that way, hey, particularly, I think, in this COVID moment, you know, we, in so many ways, inequality has been with us. I mean, we have this globalizing inequality, we have this environmental crisis that's happening, and we have almost this, yeah, over the last couple of weeks during the COVID times, I mean, I have seen support for basic income support or basic income grant from very unlikely suspects, you know? You're seeing this kind of like a recognition and a reckoning that's almost possible, but it just doesn't quite get there. So it feels like the quote of our times, to be honest, you know? And one of the things that I just have been reflecting on about, you know, just how you bring forth, how you birth, how you kind of, because you're going to actively have to force it to be born, you know? So I think sometimes when we think about our organizing, when we think about activism, when we think about, you know, what some people have called galvanizing, we, we think of injustice as something that happens over there, right? So I need to go over there to go fix it. And so you're ready to move and go against. But one of the things, if we are to do this, we need that sustainable kind of like um, movement building, right? One that goes beyond the protests, the post-protest phases full tensions, and that is able and capable of ongoing political presence. One of the things that comes to mind that we often overlook is, overlook is values, you know? Um, if we want sustained principle struggle, it's got to be rooted in values. What holds us together when there are differences, right? What informs how we hold each other accountable? What informs how we struggle together, you know? And I think once we do that kind of like, it's the unsexy work, it's the kind of like, you know, that kind of deep internal work that doesn't seem like it has value, but when you get there and you do the work actually, it has so much value and is able to sustain you beyond, right? And that is what we need to force this world to be born, um, to be born over, you know, this kind of like tension in between. Of course, there's a lot more, but that's just one part of it. And I think, yeah, we, we just, 
we overlook the hard internal work, you know, that must go on amongst us and our peers, but also just the idea that our organizing must appeal to the masses. I'm not, my protest isn't legitimate unless there's one people, one million people in the street, right? If we think about some of the biggest sustained mass movements and how they started, you know, among 12 people who were able to sit together and get something going, among people who could just contribute in such different ways, not all of them very visible, you know? I think that's just the starting point. And yeah, one can only go take it from there. I didn't answer the question, but it's just a reflection that came to mind. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it was a wonderful reflection. I feel like you did as well. I feel like you did answer it. Um, you know, we have two questions here which are quite similar, so I'm gonna put them together and feel free to, to uh, share your thoughts. One says from Yusuf, I've noticed that conversations on youth very often look at questions from the urban perspective to the exclusion essentially of both small towns and rural villages. Um, and then we have um, uh, Luanda who says, a case study undertaken by experts in the education space found that kids from urban private schools are more informed about activism over their peers from rural public schools. How do we then integrate activism into the rural schools? So this question of the different uh, lives that South Africans live, depending on the spaces where they are, and how activism links to that. Thanks, Sizwe. I mean, again, it's what counts as activism. I, the village that I come from, where I went to school under a tree, and I was doing like Michael, a pit toilet. You know, it's interesting that the young people from that village, I've been in contact with them this year, and what they're doing. I mean, I was amazed at the, the newsletter they have, what's in the newsletter, you know, out of nothing they they they're doing something but but there's a there's also an idea and and I, you know i had dinner with some uh, young people last week who one of them has just graduated the other is completing and and i was saying to them so what's next because they they are activists and and i said to them so what next as an activist what do you, what are you going to do and and you know they they talk about a life in the city in whatever and of course they have the right to do that so i dropped an idea and i said isn't it time for activism by us black people who come from the township that we say we're going to go back to the township we're going we're going to live there with my doctorate with my bcom or whatever i'm going to when I, we move into the township, we have a movement that says we move into the townships, we, 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 that's where we live. We take our children to the school nearby, we go to the church nearby. If that happens, I tell you the school in the, in the village or in the township where, 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 where the people have moved in, we'll start doing things better because the parents will come if the homework is, there's no homework or if the teaching is not order, they'll be, support for the school that and and i think i think we we need some activism and when i said that they said oh no 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 prof wait we can't move into the township how can i even move into the township it will be dangerous for me i won't even sleep one night i might just die you know that's and then i said but what if we go as a as a you're not alone so you're not like standing out alone that uh, and you, you we start working on mobilizing from within because this idea of people coming from outside to mobilize there because you know it's it's it, it's it's like you know missionaries like we we here to mobilize and i and I, I i'm toying with the idea of moving in mobilize from within be one of them uh, especially for us who come from villages i don't have to be i'm already one of them it's just that i decide to live with them and and i think I think, I think perhaps it's time for that kind of activism. I know that is not necessarily easy, but I think activist students, when, when June holidays come, December holidays come, perhaps it's time to ask myself, how, what, what activism am I taking to my village or my township? How, how am I mobilizing young people there? How am I building now that I am? Um, I, I have this advantage of being an activist in a space uh, with other people. 
yeah, I, I don't think we can just wait and, and expect someone to do it. So I'm going to... I'm gonna leave it there for asking you to respond directly to the questions because we have five minutes to go. But what I'm gonna do is read out the remainder of the questions just so that we can all hear them. And then what I'll do is ask our panelists to just deliver some, some closing remarks and summarize um, their thoughts going forward. So let me just get to a few of the people who, uh, who have also sent questions. Uh, Tobani thinks that the fees must fall movement should be taught in the school curriculum. We have uh, Craig who says that considering the massive levels of inequality and economic disparity, how do we galvanize in fighting the vast systemic issues in our society? And I think Koketso actually touched on that. Uh, Tawo wanted to raise government's IMF loan um, and what the impact of that loan would be on South Africa's youth and future generations. And Reggie um, said, taking note of high levels of unemployed graduates, what do you think the role of institutions of higher learning should be? And finally, Tahir said, in the light of social media, activism often just feels like keyboard fights. How can we bring these movements to the streets, for instance? So thank you to everybody in our uh, audience who participated. I hope you've participated in the poll as well. And then finally, to thank the Danish Embassy and Luminate, as well as everybody at Accountability Lab for, for putting this together. So uh, when we close, I'm going to come to Preti, I'm going to come to Shaira, and we're going to end off with Koketso. And I'm going to throw in my final thought, and that is that government is very comfortable. They went through a period where they weren't, and I feel like they are feeling very comfortable right now. Um, your thoughts? Thanks, Cizue. Um, uh, I, I agree with you. It's not only governments who are comfortable. I think the establishment is comfortable. And I, I, I therefore think we need, we need radicalism, the kind that can reimagine you know, because I'm in a university, I would say reimagine the university as well as its role in a constantly changing world. You know, the, 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 the kind of radicalism that accepts activism as an important part of university life, especially in today's world where there is so much poverty. Just imagine, I mean, if our students were cowed, I mean, when students rise up and, and, and protest or raise their voice, we, you know, Often adults complain, say, if our students were cowed, were docile, quiet, and uncritical, not only will our universities be poorer, but so will our society. If activists cannot be heard, if we don't ha have activists, and if we have them and they cannot be heard, then there is no chance that active citizens elsewhere in our society will be heard. So we need more voices and we just need to diversify the kind of activism in our society. So I think for me, um, what's really fundamental uh, to any question around how we move beyond the dystopia that we currently find ourselves in and escape an even worse dystopia is that we need to let go of the norms that are holding us behind, like the myth of a deserving poor, uh, when we know that poverty is structural, um, the myth that prosperity and growth are good for us, when we know that the kinds of prosperity and growth that we see are damaging and destroying the planet. Um, and through my experience in the past few months, presenting um, in civil society submissions and putting forward objections to budget cuts and uh, pushing for accountability for corruption and basic services, like distributing food parcels and grants in a once in a century global pandemic. What I've really come to realize is that the structures of government have not been set up to serve people, or if they were set up to serve people, they've been uh, captured and the state capture ruckus that we saw, I mean, it, 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 it was again a moment. We need to, to work beyond moments. We need to see beyond moments. So what I'm really interested in is how can we creatively reimagine how these spaces like our parliament, um, municipalities, public entities, and state and, uh, and civil um, organs how can they be restructured to represent and serve the people? 
And the pandemic itself, although it's making us question the very ground beneath we, which we stand, it was never going to be a portal on its, in itself to a better world. Like anything, it's what we'll make of it. And so my appeal um, is that we can't just engage in expressions of solidarity in the absence of the practice of solidarity. So Prof mentioned that, you know, we should go into the townships or we should go into rural areas. The, the townships themselves were created to keep people out. So we need to question that and we need to decide as a society, what kind of future do we want? Where do we want people to live? How do we want to develop? And I'm hoping that with a progressive youth voice, we can have something that is much more egalitarian and inclusive and democratic. The two most important things are our laws, our norms, our culture, and, our, and, and essentially our people. Um, so for me, if, if we can focus on what really counts right now, which is the exclusionary ways in which um, our society has uh, dealt with this pandemic, absolutely you know, exclusionary ways, we can also draw strength that communities have come together. Um, and if anything, it is because of communities coming together and standing in solidarity with each other that we haven't seen worse levels of hunger and crisis. So we can draw strength from that, but we also can't sit on our backs. We have to get to work. Thanks, Jaida. Um, So as mentioned, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and this just kind of Brings me to a reflection. So a founding member of the Black Youth Project, one hand, Black Youth Project 100 and author Charlene Carruthers. So in her book, she poses five questions, right? And I find them quite useful. So the five questions are, who am I? Who are my people? What do we want? What are we building? And are we ready to win? So for me, those questions and the way she describes them is that is the need for people to be clear about their own identities, what we care about, who we are responsible to and for, who we are accountable to and for, what our demands are, and whether we, what are we working towards, and if we are prepared for what we are demanding, right? It's one thing to birth a new world. It's one thing to force a portal, but are we prepared for what will come with that portal as well, you know? And I think that's the thought I want to leave us with here tonight, you know, just to reflect on, because it is clear that this is not sustainable. And I think the biggest challenge right now, the challenge of our time is for any moment that any one of us is in comfort, for as long as you are comfortable, that comfort is coming at someone else's expense, right? We should be doing something, finding ways. Um, Shaira speaks about the practice of accountability. It cannot just be expressions. It cannot just be, you know, thoughts and prayers. This is a time when we need to come together with our people and do what needs to get done. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you.